Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And once again, as we're doing every Thursday in September, we're concentrating on the performing arts and how the performing arts affects us all. The day marks the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month, so it feels particularly appropriate to be looking at how Hispanic and Latino cultures are explored and celebrated through the performing arts with our special guests. Rebecca Reed Medrano, co-founder and executive director of the Gala Hispanic Theater in Washington, D.C., and Rafael Sanchez, executive artistic director of Repertorio Español in New York City. So thank you both for joining us. It's just wonderful, wonderful to to, uh, see you again, Rebecca and Rafael, to, uh, to have you on the panel. I'm going to just sort of set you up, and I'm going to go over to you, Rebecca, More than 62 million people in America are of Latin and Hispanic descent. And in the last decade, Latin and Hispanic people account for over 51% of U.S. population growth. Spanish is the most spoken language in the country after English. And Hispanic and Latino performing arts encompass such a wide variety of disciplines, aesthetic approaches, dramatic structures, themes, and a huge diversity of cultures. So, Rebecca... You did a great show with us and, and helped to inform me about your work uh, in Washington, D.C. And Rafael, you have just um, done some amazing work. What makes uh, Hispanic American Hispanic theater so special for audiences and artists, Rebecca? Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be back here speaking with you. I think, you know, in our founding mission, Grupo de Artistas Latinoamericanos, Our mission was really to reveal the diversity of the Hispanic cultures. I think there's a great lack of knowledge. You know, there's a tendency to stereotype uh, Puerto Rican or Mexican. And really, Hispanic literature and history is not is not taught in the schools. And the voices of Hispanic creators, playwrights, artists is, is not often heard. It's very marginalized and it continues to be so, even though, as you say, The United States is the second largest Spanish speaking country outside of Mexico. So there certainly is a huge population that needs to stay connected to their roots, that appreciates the the opportunities that Gala and Repertorio offer to go back to the classics or to reinvent, uh, you know, in today's and to shine a light on voices like Nilo Cruz and all of the wonderful writers who are really the fabric of the the artistic culture and the mosaic that American theater is, but that are often overlooked and not quite understood by the broad general non-Latino public. And it's that diversity, it's that difference of perspective. We are not talking about one thing. We're not talking about one people. It's 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 just as in is as in any country you have these these amazing different regions, different sensibilities, different ideas that that come together. Rafael, uh, talk a little bit about how you expose in Repertorio Español that com- tremendous range of different experiences that encompass Latino and Hispanic culture. Well, I thank you for having me. Um, uh, this is uh, it, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, you know, I took over Repertorio two years ago <clears throat> after uh, Robert Federico, the uh, executive producer, retired. And and uh, when Repertorio started in 1968, I think that the mission was to, you know, share with uh, the United States the Hispanic culture and the classics uh, and, and to produce the best of our, of our canon uh, of plays in Spanish. And um, I think that right now, Talking about being Latino or being Hispanic is it's a, a term that is so wide uh, that what we try to do with repertorio is to have a, you know a diversity uh, among being Latinos. You know we have uh, people and plays from Argentina, Mexico, Puerto Rico, um, Spain. So what we try to do is to present a broad programming where we can present from the classic Hispanic golden age plays from Spain to contemporary Latinx theater. And, and I think it's, it's a good way to make everyone understand that being Latino or being Hispanic, it's, it's, it's not being just one thing, 
there are, well, we have some uh, things in common, but at the same time, we celebrate our individualities. Uh, so that's what we try to do with the program at Repertorio. One of the things that I think is so interesting is if you take a look, and Rebecca, I'm going to go back to the point that you made, right? We have, we are the second largest Latin Hispanic country in in the United States of America, uh, in the world, right? Mexico has a, a population of 128 million. Um, we have a population of, of people of, of, uh, of Latin Hispanic descent of 62 million. If you take a look at Honduras, it's 9.9 million. Nicaragua, 6.6 .6 million. El Salvador, uh, 6.4 million. I mean, we have this incredibly rich array of experiences of, of parents, grandparents, of, of, of kids who are here. So talk about, Rebecca, how do you actually keep faith with such an incredible, incredibly rich set of perspectives so that in your programming that you are actually revealing this tapestry in the United States? Well, that's a great question. Is this changing, ever-changing demographics, and especially in Washington, D.C., because we are not, you know, you have Miami, primarily Cuban. You have the Puerto Rican and Dominican dominating New York. Here you've got every single country. It's, it's a port of entry or a city of entry. And many people leave or come back or put down roots here and travel back and forth. So there's this constant changing. You know, you should look at our mailing list. It's a nightmare. Uh, and it always has been, but but we stay in touch with the community. And one way of doing that is through the young kids. Uh, we were not reaching enough of the Salvadoran population because they don't have a great theater tradition. Obviously with a 20 year civil war wiped out all of that. Great visual arts, um, you know, tradition. And we've done many art exhibits, but little theater. So what we did is commission plays for young kids, one called Volcanos about this myth of the mad dogs that live in the volcanos. And it was an incredible show for kids and the family started to come and all of them, you know, you'd look at the audience and say, well, who's from El Salvador and every hand would go up. So, you know, we started really trying to to engage the Central American community more, while at the same time, you know, we have the others who understand classical theater and Lope de Vega and who want to see modern. So you kind of always have to do a range of things which is, as Rafael, you know, a marketing nightmare because you're not like one thing, like Woolly Mammoth is, right. you know, edgy. You are so many things. Um, and each show at Gala is very, very different. But we do we do, do a lot of audience engagement. We have an, a year-round program called Paso Nuevo, Next Step. Uh, we now have about 60 kids who all of a sudden have turned to music. And, you know, it turns out there's a great music tradition, more music tradition than theater in Central America. They're all Central Americans, Honduran, Guatemala. Now they are writing their plays. They just did a, a classical Argentine play called El Puente de Gorostizo that they love because it's a musical. They did it as a musical um, about family tensions. So it's, it's a question of just staying in touch, talking to the audience about what they want. And, and and ever you know changing the programming um, as as we see the demographics change and the separation of the arts is not as as um, as abrupt as uh, we have in other cultures right the the integration of music of song of storytelling of poetry of of the of the spoken word Rafael how do you uh, repertorio deal with that aspect are you also um, integrating uh, music and dance and, and, and movement and those kinds of aspects into what you present, or is it mostly spoken word theater? Basically, it's a spoken, a spoken uh, theater, but we have done everything from flamenco, bringing flamenco from Spain, uh, uh, you know, uh, Latin American artists, uh, concerts, at repertorio. Um, it's, we, we really try to provide experiences that are going to engage with uh, the audience that we have and, and, and with new audiences too. And is what Rebecca was saying, you know, uh, marketing all these productions at the same time with so much variety, it's, uh, it's a challenge, but when you get to know your community and, and when you get to see the people coming to Repertorio to celebrate their roots or who they are, uh, it's easier to figure out what the next steps or the next productions we will we will produce, and at the same time, uh, you know, for example, we have La Gringa that has been twenty six years now at Repertorio, and uh, yeah, it's true, it's it's about a New Yorker 
a girl that travels to repertorio and she feels that she's treated as gringa, but when she's here, uh, she's feel she's uh, treated as as Puerto Rican. So it's this identity questioning that it doesn't relate only to Puerto Ricans, but to everyone that has the experience of immigration. So, you know, there we try to find those universal topics that, uh, you know, uh, people can relate with uh, no matter where they're from. Rafael, how do you deal with the with the um, the blessing and the challenge of uh, multilingualism? I'm I'm bilingual. I speak German and and uh, and English. And um, when you when you're in an audience that is bilingual, you have these wonderful wonderful things that you can do. But there are also members of the audience who will speak primarily Spanish and and uh, some that will speak primarily English. So you don't want to exclude. How do you, in your scripts, ensure that your audience is coming with you and in how you stage your performances so that you can encompass this whole broad range of different communication styles that are possible with your audience, um, but keep the drama going? So you're not you're not kind of constantly translating what you just said um, so that everybody gets included, right? Which which kind of gets dull. How do you how do you deal with that? I, I think that instead of a challenge, I think it's it's a beautiful way to understand who we are right now. Uh, in 1968, uh, the mission of Repertorio started for you know we we, we wanted to uh, do theater in Spanish, and now 2022, there are a huge amount of uh, Latinx people that doesn't necessarily speak Spanish. Uh, and that doesn't mean they're not Latinos, right? So uh, we have the translation system. Uh, we usually perform everything in Spanish. Some exceptions uh, have happened in the past, but the main mission is to present in Spanish and we have the subtitle system. So anyone can enjoy our shows. You don't need to be Latino or Hispanic to come to, to gala or to repertorio. We are part of the American landscape, uh, theater landscape. And, and, and you know, we, we really try to promote our work no matter the language that it is uh, written. In fact, Rebecca has a production coming uh, of uh, Native Gardens, right? And I think that, that they, they will have that challenge uh, about the language uh, sooner than we, I guess, uh, because it's an excellent uh, play and I'm sure they, they will do an, an amazing production. Rebecca, how do you, how do you deal with that, with that challenge? Well, we have done everything. When we started, we did plays. We would we were very ambitious and young and crazy. So we would do an early show in English for the gringos and everybody would change costumes and do a late show in Spanish. And then sometimes it was the same cast and they would get mixed up and it became exhausting. I thought the NEA was requiring it. And so one time I spoke to them and they said, you're crazy. We don't require you to do that. So then we went to simultaneous translations with the cast, the English speaking cast, uh, would be in the booth translating and on different nights we would do one night English, one night Spanish. Finally, we went to surtitles, which we have now. And we feel that's the best way because you're not you don't have a voice interpreting it. You know, there were actors who got out of hand and making an interpretation in your ear that distracted. But the surtitles work. We also have recently done a lot of bilingual musicals because it works uh, with something like On Your Feet or something like um, uh when we did Fame, which was actually, nobody realized it was written by a Cuban, Jose Fernandez. His whole family came uh, because he was never really recognized. He died of AIDS at age 44 and never got to see the Broadway or the whole series of Fame. So we did that bilingual. It made sense. It's a performing arts highway, high school in New York. When it makes sense dramatically, we can mix the languages. Um, definitely for the kids, Galita is all done bilingually within the same show, but not translated. It's like a progression. Like if you're talking to La Señora Tartuga and she's on her way to the market, how are you? She doesn't say, you know, she'll say something else to advance the dramatic line. That has always worked very well. And the kids don't care because they're free to go back and forth from one language to the other. But I think the important thing is to preserve the Spanish language because without language, then you're losing your heritage. The kids, the second generation Latinx Latinos did not, it's really interesting with the progression in Paso Nuevo. 10 years ago, they would come in and you would say, I'm in the Panel, and nobody would raise their hand. They're like, no, no, no. Now, they all want to do everything in Spanish. Even the gringo kids, even Afro-Americans want to do 
their work in Spanish. It's extraordinary. And what a great opportunity to learn, right? I mean, the, the fact is that when you see something that is dynamic, when it's live, when there's that immediacy to actually sit there and and try to understand what's going on, catching this word or that word. If it, I, I don't uh, have Spanish, but I can understand a few words. And then being able to impute and, and see what's going on and be engaged by the fact that those actors are in that moment and, and I'm part of that moment. What a great opportunity for, for us all to participate. But I want to ask you both uh, another question because, you know, in, in this country, we have seen these phases where people who are not whatever the us definition is, right, whether it's Irish, Irish need not apply, or, or, um, or uh, others who have come into the country and people of Latin Hispanic culture have been a target since before the country was founded, when um, the, the uh, country switched, particularly in the West and in the, in the Southwestern United States, from a, a Spanish-dominated culture to um, a, 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 a more anglicized dominated culture. How do you deal with these issues where you have politicians bussing people like cattle into different places where there is no solution to the fact that uh, American businesses are absorbing for their own work to find workers um, people from uh, south of the border, yet then reject them and, and decide that they're not going to create some sort of a work visa program, where there's this, this kind of uh, tension that is never resolved and is sometimes used to other um, uh, different parts of the population. How do you cover it? Because theater is, in many respects, it's, it's society, it's politics, it's, it's all included how do you ensure that your program doesn't become so freighted with politics that it's no longer entertaining or so entertaining that is no longer meaningful rebecca well we have always had social justice at the core of our mission because in latin america people use the theater to speak out in brazil you know with repression people wrote underground and were always creating we have always spoken out about these issues, um, including doing recent work with Jose Torres Tama, who's an advocate and social justice performer in New Orleans. We've worked with the day workers, for example, and incorporated them into going to the public plaza to tell their stories. We implemented something called Stories from the Parking Lots during the COVID, where we brought neighbors together to talk about gentrification and talk about issues of police safety and immigration. Uh, and incorporating that storytelling into um, giving them a voice. We filmed it and we wanna take it to the city council because a lot of the planning in our neighborhoods overlooks the fact that they're kicking out low income that Latinx and, and African-American and black families. And so that's our next step. We did the first part of it, which was to record various different circles about uh, interaction with the police, about how do you feel about your culture? What do you call home? Where do you go to educate your kids? Where How do you hold on to this neighborhood and your culture? Because we're in the center, it got in Columbia Heights, as you know, it was principally a, a, a black neighborhood and they were, they were pushed out and it was a Latino neighborhood and now there are very few Latino businesses and a lot of empty storefronts, you know, really bad development by greedy developers. So we give that a voice. The Paso Nuevo kids are also very, very uh, ver ver vocal, verbal, and, and write about issues of immigration and immigration policy in the, in the shows that they create. And we invite city leaders to see those and we invite the neighbors and the audiences. But it's, it, is, it is really becoming a huge problem. You know, they just, they just bust in 9,500 immigrants. And one of them, my neighbors, were trying to find these people work. They're supposed to have work visas, but he wants to be in Miami because he's Cuban looking for his family and he ends up in DC. It's horrible. It's just willy nilly. Let's get people because there's a political fight going on. And we have to, as artists, really be clear about what that means and look at the history, you know, the United States of amnesia, they've forgotten what they did to the Chinese and the Japanese and all of the immigrants and the Irish. I mean, it's it's the same thing that's happening and it's very sad, but uh, we, we we're trying to, you know, integrate that into our programming as much as possible and and commission uh, artists to to tell those stories. Rafael, how do you approach this of, of using theater to to uh, tell these stories without becoming a scold and boring? 
Well, I, I think theater for all the time has been, you know, portraying our stories and, and there's no way to uh, tear apart uh, the real life and, and the things that must be said uh, from theater. I, if not, it's just entertainment. And, and, and I think that uh, trying to highlight our stories, our positive stories, you know, not the, not the stereotypes that uh, other people want to say about us. Um, it's, it's a good way to connect with, uh, with everyone and at the same time to be involved in, in these challenges that, that we are uh, seeing. Also working with, with, with the students and the educational programs that we have, like Gala, we work with the council members uh, in New York. We, we provide uh, workshops to the students. We are in negotiations with uh, some council members to uh, show our work to the immigrants that are coming from Texas uh, to New York. And it, it's, it's a way to be political, involved, uh, because if we're artists and we are not aware of what's going on in our community and our work, our work doesn't it, it doesn't make sense. We, we well, your don't. your art is, and the art of your artists is emerging from their li lived experience, from their realities, and realities um, are not neatly packaged, and it's not all sweetness and light. I mean, I think that that is the purpose of theater is to tell stories, tell tell real stories, uh, whether it's um, from the um, from the Shakespearean perspectives, which were real issues that people confronted all the way to today's uh, today's uh, circumstance. Uh, talk a little bit, Rafael, about the integration of education and your different programs in your work, because you don't actually separate, again, into the little neat buckets, uh, the different aspects of your work. And, I, and then I'd like, Rebecca, if you could also describe, because education has always been a very strong aspect of Gala as well. But Rafael, talk about, talk about how you approach that. It's amazing because most people come to Repertorio, to the theater uh, at 27th Street, and they, they are not aware of the educational work that we, that we, that Repertorio does, you know. Um, yeah, we don't separate one thing from the other. Uh, we have teaching artists working in basically every district in New York uh, with the schools, uh, after school programs. Uh, we bring the students at 11 a.m. performances with subsidized tickets. Uh, so, uh, you know, it doesn't matter their income resources and, and where they come from, uh, they can enjoy our work. And uh, we also do a lot of tours. Uh, we, <clears throat> we have performed uh, in every place you can imagine, from an office to a, the a big theater in every, in every borough of the city. And, and, and we are also now, after the pandemic, we um, transition some of our programs into online programming and we are providing you know, those, those uh, experiences uh, to uh, students, not only in New York, but the rest of the country, which I think it's something positive that we, we ended up uh, finding uh, after the, the challenging times of the pandemic. And education allows for interactivity, right, Rebecca? I mean, instead of just being an audience sort of watching whatever is presented, education is much more interactive. It's a much more um, immersive experience that complements the, the onstage performance. Absolutely. And we do it um, just as Repertorio does. We have a student matinee program. They have more than we do. They consider in a tremendous school district. But every one of our main stage plays, no matter whether it is uh, appropriate for high school people or not, I'm going to tell you this, we insist on offering it to schools. Sometimes the shows are toned down a little bit for the high schools, but normally we want these kids, you know, they see much worse uh, violence and stuff on the screens, right? But we bring them pre-pandemic about 9,000 uh, high school students and elementary students would say, so we have the program for our main stage. Every one of those plays has about six matinees, school matinees. During the matinee program, there's an opportunity to, for talkbacks. So we have a facilitator, they meet the artists, they discuss the themes, and all of the schools receive a study guide before attending. So the study guide has context, a background on the author, what it means, relevance to today, reading list, all of those kinds of things. And we've noticed that this has enabled the teachers to incorporate some of this material into the actual curriculum so that they, you know, they weren't reading Lorca, but they were reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez. 
and it enables the teachers to expand their, their curriculum. We also have the Galita Little Kids program is also student matinees uh, during the week. And then on the weekends, we open it to, to general audiences. But yes, it is really a part of, of educating uh, the, the greater public as to the beauty of the language, the, 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 the themes, the diversity. And it's necessary because you're reaching the next generation of theater goers. I must say, I'm going to go back to something you said before about, you know, a little Spanish. You know, I always want to cater to what I call the closet Spanish speakers because, uh, you know, at Gala, our, our motto is language is never a barrier. It's a bridge. And a lot of people are afraid to come because they think they won't understand it. So it is still a challenge. The other challenge, as you said before, is making something so political that it hits you over the head and they don't want to come, especially post-pandemic. We've designed this season to be all around comedy just because people want relief. Oh, but, yeah. it's co- but it's still comedy with a message. And, and like Rafael said, this Native Gardens is interesting because originally it's a gringo family and a border dispute between gringos and Latinos. Now they're going to be two Latino families. So it's interaction and fighting within Latinos in Spanish. We'll see how it goes. It'll be very interesting. Karen Zacharias is a playwright and she's great. She's a national. Well, it's, it's one of those cor- courageous choices that's, that's so important. You know, if you, it, it's very easy to create separations between white America and Latino Hispanic uh, uh, America, but you can also take a look in every single community that we have in this country, we have interfamily issues. We have issues between people who are dark skin and wider uh, and lighter skin. We have people who are of, of more native heritage or people who, who are from this country or that country are othered within our own communities. It happens in every single community. How do you deal with such complexity? Again, without hitting people over the head, but also bringing people to an understanding that really the problem is is within ourselves. It's not somebody else who has a problem. It's actually me. How do you deal with that, Rebecca? How do you deal with that, uh, uh, Rafael? Well, I, I think that we, we have to admit that we have done things wrong in the past. It doesn't matter if we're Latinos, if we're, if we're uh, from any other, you know, ethnicity or it, it, being Latino is white. You can be Afro-Latino. You can, you can be white. You can be poor. It doesn't matter. The thing is that we have to recognize those, uh, uh, those, th- that reality and we have to center stage uh, everyone and the diversity that we are. So uh, a repertorio, we just... Because that's part of the story as well, right? I mean, we, we have issues of religion, we have issues of politics, we have issues of, of perspective. I mean, that's part of the story as well, right? But I, th- I think that we have the opportunity, at least a repertorio and, and gala, we have the opportunity to produce different works uh, in the same season. And, and that's something amazing because we can, you know, have something for everyone, you know, like, uh, and, and that diversity, I think it's, 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 it's easy to see it in, in our programming. Uh, uh, we opened uh, right before the pandemic, uh, the brief wondrous life of Oscar Wao, uh, you know, and it's a story about Afro Latinos and it's made by, you know, uh, uh, by Afro Latinos and, 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 having the theater, uh, you know, with younger audiences, coming to see a production like this one, it's, it's really exciting. And I think it's, it's something that we have to pay attention and, and, and be sure that we are providing experiences and, 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 and theater for everyone, not, not only for one kind of Latino. And plus there is, there is a real uh, connection to your, your lives as both artists and administrators, right, Rebecca? Because you're also programming for your audience. You have to bring people in the door. You have to bring in ticket buyers. You have to bring in, how, how does that work? How do you navigate your sensibility as an artist on the one hand? You might have something that you really want to cover, but you've decided this year it's going to be comedy. We all need a break. I really want to cover it, but I'm going to have to defer that because people need a break. And also those people who need a break will buy tickets. Right. The, if, if it's all heaviness, I'm not going to come. And you have a business to run. Yeah. And it is complex because, as you know, Ugo, my partner, was the founder and he's the artist. And he always wants to do exotic wild things that I think nobody will come see. So, <laughs> we're, so it's amazing that we're still together for seven years longer because I'm like, Ugo, 
No one is going to come see this Argentine play that's about Grotowski, you know, it's just not going to. But we balance it. So we've always had, you know, the classical, the modern, and I'm always an eye out to, okay, this is why we started doing the Broadway musicals in Spanish with Luis Salgado. And the truth was, Hugo was not really interested, um, but it brought in the tickets. So we can afford to do something with our Spanish partners like Doña Rosita, which was a new adaptation of a Lorca that some people didn't understand and was not well attended. We can afford to do that if we balance it with a musical. This year, we are ending with not a Broadway musical, but a very interesting one that Hugo is working on, an original uh, show about Afro-Peruvian culture and history based on uh, Santa, the family of Nicomes and Victoria Santa Cruz who in the 60s promoted the whole Afro-Peruvian culture against all odds because the white Peruvian society didn't give them the time of day. So again, it will be something very interesting working with, a, with the white people in the embassy to see how we are pointing out, you know, that it, you don't, it's not just a thing of white versus like it's totally within each culture. I mean, the same thing happened with the Puerto Rican play we did last year that we commissioned with Karina Alcevich, who works very much with Repertorio as well. She was very nervous because it was based on Rosario Ferrer's famous novel, and there's a black servant. And she's like, oh, I can't, I can't, just can't write one more black person into this. And we're like, you have to because this exists. There is discrimination against black people in Puerto Rico. So, and there was this whole discussion, but it, it made the play richer. And, and more authentic and, and truthful. We have to look at those things that Rafael said. We have to look at ourselves and look at the background of our cultures. You know, it's not just here the work on racism needs to be done. It's all over the world. Well, it's in our hearts, right? I mean, that's, exactly. that's, that's the issue. We have to discuss it. We have to out it. We have to think about it. And we have okay. to deal with it, right? And, and, and that's, that's the mix that you're talking about, that it can't all be one thing. It can't... It, you can't alienate your audience by constant repetition, but you also can't avoid topics, right, Rafael? Yeah, it's it's about what people want to see and what we as artists want to share with people. And and you know, it's it's not an easy job. Sometimes it's not um, pleasant to take some decisions, uh, but I think you know it's part of our work. If, if not, we're just you know commercial theater. Uh, you know, selling tickets, which we we want to sell tickets to. Uh, but, you know, it's what Rebecca said. If, if you have a balance with your program, you can do whatever you want to. And Rafael, you never have, have heated arguments internally to uh, Repertorio Espanol. Everybody just always agrees on everything. And there's, there's no... Yeah. Right? <laughs> Where, where does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> but but isn't isn't it true that a certain amount of, of that conflict is so important to quality, right? It's 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 the passion to see your vision and then have somebody else with a different vision and and go like this, right? Rub I it. Think, and, uh, yeah, I, I I think it, we we have to be open to learn, no matter your leadership position the years that you have been uh, doing your job, uh, is just having the mind open to learn uh, and ask for help sometimes. Like we, we, we just open Eva Luna based on Isabel Allende's novel and there is a transgender uh, character and we hired a consultant because not only me, not only the director, but the cast and everyone need to know how to manage this new situation that we haven't been through and, and how to cast someone for that role and, and, and think about, okay, we, uh, you know, something like you never thought about, like, are you doing a play with a transgender uh, character, but you don't have bathrooms for transgender audiences. So it's like things you, you don't think about it and you f seek help and, and try to learn uh, and be better. One of the things that, that I'm constantly made aware of is that the various isms start off as being completely unconscious. We are unconscious about our attitudes. We just have them. We've, been, we've grown up with them. And then all of a sudden, you get told by your daughter or your son that the thing that you took for granted is completely wrong. And, and they're not shy about telling you. Right. They hit you over the head with it every day. And eventually you start to think, well, I don't know, maybe maybe I need to think differently. Right, Rebecca? 
Absolutely. And I think what Rafael said is so true. We learn every day and it keeps us young. I mean, you know, I've been doing this since I was 24. I'm 74 and I still learn every single day. I'm amazed. It's always a miracle when a show comes up. I'm, I always think it's a miracle when anybody, when any artist, anybody at Repertorio or anywhere gets a show up in Spanish and you learn so much. We learn from each other. I do think it's going to be new challenges, um, as Rafael said, in working with with such diverse gender populations now. We're going to do something daring with the kids. This is real elementary school. I'm talking second, third grade called Principe Principe, which is a fairy tale about two princes who marry each other, not the princess, because the, the, uh, the queen tries to bring all of the princesses of the kingdom and he doesn't like any of them. And so we're marketing this to schools. We'll see what happens uh, if we get pushed back. I'm sure we will, but I'm sure the kids will love it because it's a beautiful fairy tale about love and that love transcends any gender stereotypes. But again, it'll be a challenge. You know, it's one thing that Ugo insisted on doing. And we're like, no, maybe we should do something a little lighter or something that wouldn't get pushed back from maybe not the schools, maybe the parents. We'll see. But it'll be interesting. It'll That's be fun. fun. But, uh, and so, we, we have know. hired a consultant, too, with that, uh, Rafael. I think you always need advisors on these things about how far can you go, you know, in terms of movement. And even now you're supposed to have intimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you all do it, Repertorio. We, we, we have resisted that up till now, but I know a lot of actors want to work with intimacy uh, okay. coaches. Right. So, yeah, yeah we, we are doing it. Uh, and yeah, it's something that we, again, we gave for granted before, like, oh, there is a scene, we, we, we will just kiss each other, or we will just do it. There's no nothing, like, we're actors, we do everything. And then after everything we learned the last years, you know, it's true that someone is needed to supervise those those kind of situations. So yeah, we're we we are, we are hiring them now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So um, uh, when I was younger, I, I, I was often, um, involved with people who came out of the theater. And I heard the stories about from women who were um, working on stage with male actors who they felt took advantage night after night after night. And they were told that they just were not professional enough. In other words, the women were not professional enough to, to uh, suck it up. Who knows what the reality is? It's, it's impossible to tell. But the idea of actually talking about it in rehearsal and actually dealing with the issue proactively. Again, it's something that nobody thought about before because there was this idea of, you know, the show must go on and you do whatever's necessary and it's on stage and it doesn't matter and so on and so forth. Well, maybe it does matter and maybe we have to change our operations, which means our whole cost structure changes and, and, and the way we do business changes. It's, it, I think it's a safety thing for everyone. Everyone is going to feel more comfortable when you need to choreography a fight and the director doesn't necessarily know how to do it. You hire someone to, to do that job because that there has to be some consistency. At Repertorio, we change actors all the time, last minute. Can you imagine with COVID, someone call, uh, they cannot come. So you, you have to really be sure of the structure that you have so everyone can do it safely and, and, and comfortably, uh, you know, it's our work is too intimate to, you know, give it for granted that it's going to be easy to do. So Can I ask a question? I have yeah. a question for, for, for Rafael. Do you all have gender specific dressing rooms? Because that's an issue that's new for us because we've always had cast that didn't mind sharing a dressing room. We do have individual dressing rooms. During our larger show of On Your Feet, because we had child actors, we did have to separate men, women, and, you know, gender nonspecific. It's an economic issue and a space issue. Um, uh, we're taking it show by show and cast by cast. Uh, some casts get real energy from being sharing in the same dressing room. You know, that's, that's another thing that I feel kind of sad that uh, they can't like warm up together because there have to be men and women, women. I'm just curious, have you done that yet? No. We, well, you know that repertory space is extremely, you know, small. So we're all together in, in a couple of, of, rest, uh, of uh, dressing rooms in the second floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and since we, you know, we share those dressing rooms with, nine different productions and nine different casts. We don't label the dressing rooms. It's, there's no stars. 
Uh, our repertorio, this is everyone's space and we share it. As of today, we haven't uh, had any situation or request by anyone. And I guess that if, 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 if the time comes, uh, we will have to address it. But by now, um, repertorio, we are like a family. We're all together all the time and, and, and nobody, you know, they, they, they know when they start working at repertorio uh, uh, about the, the resources that we have. And the truth is that when you have nine ca nine different casts, you cannot provide a space, a single uh, space just for, for one person in particular. Well, I'm happy to hear that because we we feel the same way and a lot of our cast members do want to be in the same. It's just whether it becomes a legality, I don't know whether, you know, I mean, we have never had a problem ever, but who knows? You know, I'm becoming very paranoid about the whole <laughs> <laughs> gender. Well, how do you how do how do you deal with with changing sensibilities? Uh, Rebecca just shared with us uh, one of the shows that that uh, she and Hugo are are, are uh, putting on um, that that she found really uh, found really exciting. She finds really exciting. Um, Rafael, why don't you take us out with with what is exciting you about your your coming performances? Well, I. You know, we have a couple of projects in the pipeline uh, before the pandemic, and I'm very happy that we were able to open this season, Eva Luna and, and La Dama Boba. I think it was a good first season for me because it's uh, um, an adaptation of, of a Latin American novel by Isabel Allende, and then we have a, a Golden Age Hispanic uh, play. I, come, I wanted to do a comedy. You know, I wanted to bring Lope de Vega, you know, not 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 the place that everyone knows, but at the same time, some production that people will enjoy so much that they will say, I want to see another play of Golden Age uh, Spanish. So uh, I'm very proud of the last season and I'm very proud of the next season that we are preparing. We're doing The Swallow, La Golondrina uh, by Guillem Clua. Um, he's a wonderful playwright uh, from Spain. Uh, we did Smiley in the past and this is a way to try to you know, I want to bring younger audiences to the theater while at the same time respecting and honoring the legacy and, and the audience that is engaged with repertorio. And that particular play is inspired in the terrorist attacks uh, uh, of the LGBTQ uh, club uh, Pulse in Florida. Uh, right. And, you know, it's not literally um, what happened there. It's a conversation between two different persons uh, that have something in common that I will not reveal. Uh, and it's a very conservative mother that lost uh, someone and uh, um, a, young, a young boy. And I think that having this powerful conversation between two different ways of seeing life and love, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that inspires me to, to, you know, to, to do this season, to have it in the season. And these conversations are happening every day across America. It is wonderful that you and your audi audiences, your theaters and your staff are helping us to experience them. Uh, Rafael Sanchez, Executive Artistic Director of Repertorio Español in New York City. Rebecca Reed Medrano, co-founder and Executive Director of the Gala Hispanic Theater in Washington, D.C. Always great to have you on, Rebecca. Great to have you on, Rafael. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Please thank your art, your uh, artists, your audiences, your staffs, your board, your funders. You are really helping us, helping us enjoy life, enjoy life, and be informed by others. Thank you so much. And have thank a you, Mark. Day. It's been a pleasure. Thank oh, you. Oh, it's the pleasure is mine. I'm in your debt.